Good morning. We're going to continue on page 276 from Inside of a Dog. The elements that make play enjoyable are hard to pinpoint, just as a great joke always seems to be funnier than its deconstruction. Try getting a robot to play with you. They always seem to lack a certain playfulness. A few years ago, Sony developed a mechanical pet, Ibo, designed to look like a dog. It is four-legged, has a tail, characteristic head form, etc., and acts something like a dog. It wags, barks, and performs simple trained dog routines. What the Ibo does not do is play like a dog, and the designers wanted it to be more playfully interactive with people. rain, so I have to roll up the windows. With this in mind, I studied dogs and humans playing together. Wrestling, chasing, tossing, and retrieving balls and sticks and ropes. I watched, videotaped, and then transcribed all the behaviors that each of the participants did. Then I looked for the elements that were consistent across the successful bouts of the interspecies play. What I hoped to find were clear routines and games that could be modeled in a doggish toy such as an Ibo. What I found was both simpler and more powerful. In every bout, the player's actions were importantly contingent on, based on and related to, the other's actions. This established a rhythm to the play. Such contingency is easily seen in even very early human social interaction. At two months, infants coordinate simple movement with their mothers, such as mirroring facial expressions. In play, coordinated responses to actions, such as a ball leaving a thrower's hand, happened in as little as five frames of the videotape, approximately one-sixth of a second. Mirrored responses lunging after being lunged at, for example, are rife during play. The timing is crucial. Dogs respond to our movements in the time frame another human might. A simple game of fetch, for instance, is a dance of call and response. We enjoy the game because of the dog's reactive readiness to respond to our actions. Cats, by contrast, are simply not enjoyable fetch playmates. They may, in fact, fetch you an object, but it will be in their own time. Dogs participate in a kind of communion with their owners around the ball, with each responding at a con conversational pace in seconds, not hours. The dogs are acting like very cooperative humans. Another game is simply doing an activity in parallel, running together. In play between dog, parallelism is common. Two dogs may mimic each other's gaping mouths, yawning back and forth, Often one dog will observe and then match the other's preoccupation, hole digging, stick chewing, ball trumpeting. As wolves hunt together collaboratively, this ability to act with others, matching their behavior, might come from their ancestry. To have your play slap matched by a dog's is to feel suddenly in communication with another species. We experience a dog's responsiveness as expressive of a mutual understanding we are on this walk together. We are playing together. Researchers who have looked at the temporal pattern of interactions with our dogs find that it is similar to the timing pattern among mixed sex strangers flirting and to the timing among soccer players as they move down the field. That feels like great teamwork. They are hidden sequences of paired behaviors that repeat in interaction. A dog looking at the owner's face before picking up a stick. A person pointing and a dog following the point to where it's directed. The sequences are repeated and they are reliable. So we begin to get the feeling over time that there is a shared covenant of interaction between us. None of the sequences is itself profound, but none is random. And together they have a cumulative... Commu <laughs> of results. <laughs> I swear I know that word. <laughs> anyway, 
walk down Fifth Avenue in Midtown Manhattan around lunchtime on a weekday and you experience the frustration and pleasure of being a member of the human species. The sidewalks are mobbed, jammed with tourists wandering and gawking, office workers rushing to grab lunch or dallying before returning, enterprising street vendors rushing from enforcement officers. It is a formidable sight, one you may not relish joining. On most days, though, you can take any pace you'd like and just as easily wind your way through the crowds. It has been speculated that people walking in mass don't crush into each other because we are instantly and easily predictable. It only takes a glance to calculate when the oncoming person will reach you. You unconsciously veer subtly right to avoid him. He has done the same with you. It is not unlike, but not quite as completely successful as the school of fish that abruptly, with one mind, turns tail and goes back from where it came. We are social, and social animals coordinate their actions. What dogs do is cross the species line and coordinate with us. Pick up the leash of any dog in your neighborhood and suddenly you are walking together, like old friends. The significance of these three elements is corroborated by the kind of feelings generated when they disappear, of mild betrayal, of momentary severance of the bond. There is a feeling of disconnect when a dog, one, reaches for ducks, her head away, preventing contact. Okay, let's try that again. There's a feeling of disconnect when a dog, one, reached four ducks her head away, preventing contact. The frustration is immediate when a dog may stop cooperating and taking turns in a game, refusing to bring the ball back, not seeing the toss or pursuing a seen toss. A betrayal is felt when the simple communication, come, isn't followed by a dog, coming. And it would be heartbreaking to approach your dog and to fail to prompt a tail to wag ears to flatten to the head or a stomach to be bared for scratching. Dogs whom we perceive as stubborn or disobedient are those dogs who flout these elements. But these elements are natural for both them and for us. A disobedient dog more likely simply does not realize what rules he is being asked to obey. The bond effect. Our bond with dogs is strengthened by contrast, by synchrony, and by marking reunions with a greeting ceremony. So too are we strengthened by the bond. Simply petting a dog can reduce an overactive, sympathetic nervous system within minutes. A racing heart, high blood pressure, the sweats, levels of endorphins, hormones that make us feel good, and oxytocin and prolactin, those hormones involved in social attachment go up when we're with dogs. Cortisol, which is a stress hormone, levels go down. There is good reason to believe that living with a dog provides the social support, which correlates with reduced risk for various diseases, from cardiovascular disease to diabetes to pneumonia, and better rates of recovery from those diseases that we do get. In many cases, the dog receives nearly the same effect. Human company can lower a dog's cortisol levels. Petting can calm a racing heart. For both of us, this is a kind of placebo, which is not to say that it isn't real, but that a change is induced in us without a known agent of the change. Bonding with a pet can do the work that long-term use of prescribed drugs or cognitive behavioral therapy do. Of course, it can go wrong too. Separation anxiety is the consequence of a dog feeling so very attached that he cannot stand a moment of detachment. What are the other results of this bond? We've seen how much they know about us, our smell, our health, our emotions, due not just to their sensory acuity, but also to their simple familiarity with us. They come to know how we normally act, smell, and taste over the course of our days 
and then they are able to notice many times in ways we cannot when there is a deviation. The bond effect works because dogs are at their best acting as extreme as extremely good social interactants. They are responsive and crucially, they pay attention to us. And this connection to us runs deep. A simple experiment consisting of dogs and yawning humans indicates that our link is instinctual on the level of reflex. Dogs catch our yawns, just as happens between humans, dog subjects who saw someone yawning themselves began uncontrollably yawning in the next few minutes. Chimpanzees are the only other species we know of for whom yawning is contagious. Spend a few minutes yawning at your own dog. Try not to glare, giggle, or give in to his inevitable complaints. And you can see for yourself this deep-seated connection between human and dog. Yawning dogs aside, there is a limit to the science here. Science is quite intentionally not looking at the very feature that is most important to dogs, owners, the feeling of the relationship between person and dog. That feel is made up of daily affirmations and gestures, coordinated activities, shared silence. It can be deconstructed somewhat with the dull butter knife of science but it cannot be reproduced in an experimental setting. It is importantly non-experimental. Experimenters often use what is called a double-blind procedure to assure the validity of their data. The subject is always blind to the point of the experiment. And in a double-blind, the experimenter is also blind to which subject's data, one from the experimental group or the control group. He is analyzing. In that way, one avoids inadvertently seeing a subject's behavior as fitting in just a little more tightly with the tested hypothesis. Dog-human interactions, by contrast, are happily double-seeing. We have the feeling of knowing exactly what the dog is doing. The dog may, too. What we think we see is not the stuff of good science, but it is the stuff of a rewarding interaction. That bond changes us. Most fundamentally, it nearly instantly makes us someone who can commune with animals. With this animal, this dog. A large component of our attachment to dogs is our enjoyment of being seen by them. They have impressions of us. They see us in their eyes. They smell us. They know about us and are poignantly and indelibly attached to us. The philosopher Jacques Derrida ruminated on his cat seeing him nude. He was startled and embarrassed. To Derrida, what was startling was that the animal reflected his image back to him. When Derrida saw his cat, what he saw was his cat seeing him in nakedness. Last paragraph of chapter 9. He was right to implicate our self-regard and our regard of our pets. As far as I know, though, Dorita never had a dog. His discomfiture might have been greater at the dog's superior gaze. Of course, we revel in the animals themselves. Still part of what we see when we look at a dog is the dog looking at us. This is a component of our bond, too. I still imagine my dog, Pumpernickel, looking at me, seeing herself in my eyes. And I look at her, seeing myself in hers. I appreciate you listening to the rest of chapter 9 this morning. I hope you've enjoyed the sunrise and the beautiful sounds of rain.